And now we return to As the Paint Dries. All right, sir, what seems to be the trouble today? Ooh. Biff! Panterley. What happened to you? Well, I was helping Dylan remodel his kitchen. Dylan? Yes, Dylan. Dylan. Yes, Dylan. Well, anyway, he's not too familiar with how to work around tools, Panterley. Yes? So, as a result, it appears that I have suffered a few mishaps. <laughs> mm -hmm. And so, seeing as you're a famous allergist... Heart surgeon. I thought it made sense for me to just drop in and have you fix me up. Oh, all right, Biff. Where should we start? Probably here. Oh, Biff, for Pete's sake. Oh, Pete wasn't there, Painterly. Hey everyone, I'm Andy. Welcome to Furniture Fables. Risk. Every day we all take some, whether we walk to the mailbox or clean out the lion's cage. And in the world of furniture fabling, where we often combine the skills of painter, refinisher, and woodworker, as well as working with a lot of vintage materials, we can come across our fair share. And with DIY continuing to skyrocket in popularity, our little niche can even find itself playing host to some truly dangerous and even deadly DIY hack trends. But fear not, friends, because knowledge is power. I hope that you stay with me to the end of this very important fable. Can you believe this is an actual advertisement for lickable lead paint? Of course, in 1978, after the discovery that lead paint is toxic when ingested or inhaled, especially for children, it was banned for residential use in the United States. Nowadays, most people think about any remaining risk from lead paint coming primarily from houses or apartments built before that time. As that aging paint peels and flakes, it could be ingested by children, or if it is sanded and removed without proper know-how, that lead dust could be inhaled. But the DIYer and furniture fablers have to be careful of this hazardous material too. Most of the pieces I choose to work with are unpainted, but every once in a while I will pick up a painted piece of furniture or decor. But before I begin an ounce of work, I bust out one of these, a lead test stick. These are from 3M. To activate the test, you simply squeeze at points A and B, shake a couple of times, and then squeeze the yellow liquid out as you rub the end of the test over the area of concern. After 30 seconds, if you see any pink, the test has detected lead. But here's an important tip. Oftentimes people forget that paint wasn't just used on the wooden bodies of furniture, it was used on the hardware as well. This is a little side table I just did with this cool curved pull. After I removed it, I took a good look at it. At first I thought I was seeing a dull brass, but then I saw that this was a painted gold. Yep, see right there? So I decided to sand it back a bit before planning to give it a new coat of an antique bronze paint. This is actual footage of me sanding it by hand. Yes, I am wearing my respirator mask when I started to notice something odd. The paint appears to be shining up, getting more and more glossy and sparkly. This is strange, I thought. This is just not what any modern paint I have ever worked with looks like when you sand it. Suddenly, a nagging thought in the back of my mind rose to the forefront, and I stopped what I was doing, and I grabbed a lead test. Yeah. 
Yep. Positive for lead. Well, I did a very thorough cleanup of the entire work area, including my camera, my clothes. I actually tossed my t-shirt and I took a shower. From everything that I can find, I probably wasn't exposed to enough lead paint dust to really worry about it. However, I will be mentioning this to my doctor the next time that I see him, but this was not good. And I share it with you now just to show you how easy it was for me to find myself absentmindedly sanding back lead paint. As for my little side table here, I did go ahead and take its glamour shots with that original pull, but once the replacement arrived, I removed that old pull and I gave this new one a quick sanding and then I sprayed it with some warm antique bronze paint before adding a little hit of gold and then installing it. I also went ahead and I gave it a little bit of gilding wax just to kind of warm it up a little bit more. It's true that using a clear shellac primer could seal up a piece of hardware that had lead on it, but I just do not feel comfortable knowingly sending out something with even a speck of lead paint. Looks pretty darn good. You know, it's too bad. It's not the original pull. It's, it's always really great when you can keep anything original, especially the hardware, but I'd rather have this than sparkly gold lead paint right at toddler level. This was the right choice and it, it looks pretty good. In 1996, the Lane Furniture Company and the Consumer Product Safety Commission recalled 12 million cedar chests. But even after that mass recall, many of these trunks remained in people's homes. I came across one of them and did a very whimsical Alice in Wonderland makeover before I sold it, but not before I had completely disabled that old lock. Here you can see I'm unscrewing that plate and then using my pliers, I'm just removing that metal tongue piece essentially. With that piece removed, the lock is no more. I added a little bit of gilding wax to the outside portion of it, and it really is just now decorative, part of the imagination of this piece. It is probably best to disable any lock on any piece of furniture that you are working with in which a child could become trapped. If a customer really wants to be able to lock, say, a trunk, they can send away for a lock for that piece of furniture that meets current safety requirements. Power saws, the great white sharks of the DIY world. I cannot tell you how many people I have met who have expressed a real fear of power saws of all types and kinds. And before I go any further, let me just say that that fear is probably 
a sign of intelligence. It is completely normal and rational to have a fear of something that is so obviously powerful, especially when you have not ever had the chance to learn how it works and how to use it safely. Plus, they're really loud. If you feel afraid of power saws, do not feel bad about it and never let anyone pressure you into using them, myself included. If you don't want to use them, don't. If, however, you are curious and you would like to learn but you're feeling anxious about it, just remember this. A healthy respect for all power tools is probably a really smart thing, but if you can drive a car, you can use a power tool, including a power saw. The two saws that I use the most are the miter saw and the circular saw. I do own a table saw, but it's not currently set up. I would like to make some space for it and start learning more about it and getting better at using it and just kind of showing you as I learn along the way, I think maybe that might be kind of interesting for all of us. As far as these two guys go, the most basic safety tip for saws is keep your fingers away from the blades. I know, it's genius. Six inches is always kind of a good distance to aim for as a goal. And after that, wear safety glasses or goggles with your glasses under them if you need them. Wear ear protection. Wear a mask. Don't wear loose fitting clothing, jewelry or hair. Always keep your eyes on your work. Talk to your family about not distracting you when you are using a power saw. This is not the moment to tap someone on the shoulder and ask, mom, are we out of milk? Let the blade come to a full and complete stop before you set the saw down. Don't overextend. Move your feet so that you are always balanced and in full control. Also, check the blade for sharpness from time to time. Just like with kitchen knives, a sharper blade is actually safer. Only change the blades when the saw is unplugged. Don't don't change a blade when the saw's plugged in. When you are using your circular saw, make sure you are using both hands for maximum control and use clamps. Clamps are fantastic. They are like the little elves of the workshop. Have you ever found yourself in there working and thought, if only I had a team of helpers here? Clamps are like that. They're fantastic. Use the clamps. Clamps are the little elves of woodworking. If saws are the great white sharks, then noise and dust are the mosquitoes. Probably what we should be more concerned with, but just kind of harder to get excited over. Noise and dust are not particularly sexy topics, but they are hugely impactful on the health of those folks who work around them daily. And as with many environmental dangers, it's all about long-term exposure. And we're playing the long game here. It is so easy to be blase about noise. Oh, just one little quick chop of the saw. But our hearing is impacted every single time it is exposed to decibels over a certain level. A decibel, of course, is just a unit of measurement for sound. A-weighted decibels, abbreviated DBA, in case you're interested, are an expression of the relative loudness of sounds in the air as perceived by our ears. So, how loud is my Furniture Fables shop? This is a decibel meter app I downloaded for free onto my phone. Let's see what it says about some of my power tools.
here on this very interesting noise levels chart, you can see the decibel levels for all these different things. This is very interesting. Everything from leaves rustling to a motorcycle or, or a hairdryer. We see that sounds over 70 decibels will harm hearing over time. Every single one of those tools caused that decibel meter to go over 70 dB. Pretty eye-opening or ear-opening, I guess. So what can we do to protect ourselves? Well, probably we can be mindful about just how long we've been using that power saw, but our best line of defense is probably with these and these. A good pair of ear protectors will cut noise by 20 to 30 decibel levels. As long as you are using them correctly, you wanna make sure that they have covered your entire ear and are really nice and snug up against your head. And if you are using earplugs with them, well, you can tack another 10 to 15 decibel drop onto that number. I have never used both at the same time, but I don't know. I'm thinking that next time I have a really long sanding project or many, many trips over to the miter or table saw, I might just be doubling up. Wood dust, a known human carcinogen. Wood dust that settles into the nose and nasal passages has been shown to cause cancer of the sinuses, as well as of course, a whole host of respiratory issues. So. Okay, what can we do to protect ourselves? Well, obviously we can wear a good mask. Now, many woodworkers will just wear a simple dust mask or even something like this, this kind of simple basic surgical mask. And yes, something like this will block a certain amount of particulates from entering into your lungs. I, however, never use these preferring to opt for this baby. This is a respirator by 3M and it is outfitted with cartridges that will also block many of the fumes or vapors that I will be exposed to, like from primer or oil-based stains or poly top coats, as well as protecting me from all of that wood dust. Now, some may say that this is overkill for sanding. I don't. I kind of like the idea of giving my lungs the gold standard treatment. <laughs> By the way, please do keep in mind that depending on how often you use a respirator like this, you should wash the inside as that's just kind of a hygiene issue. It's very easy to do. All you do is detach these cartridges and take out the little valves and swish it around with some warm water and a mild soap and you're good to go. The biggest game changer for me has been using a dust collection system. This one here was a bit of a splurge, but in my opinion, absolutely worth it. This is the Festool CT MIDI Bluetooth HEPA dust extracting system, and it's the rock star of dust collection and extraction systems, if you ask me. It does come with a rock star price. This one will set you back about 660 bucks. That makes sense for me or someone like me. I am out here sanding something almost every day, certainly several times a week. If, however, you are more of a hobbyist and you are interested in a dust collection system, you don't have to spring for this baby here. I have heard really, really good things about a system called the Dust Deputy. This is something that you hook up to an existing shop vac and it apparently does a really great job at trapping and collecting all of that wood sanding dust and kind of spares your vacuum unit part of the shop vac. Apparently the Dust Deputy Plus, just kind of your standard shop vac, will be more about $175, maybe to $225, depending on where you are. And I have to say, any kind of system that you invest in that is going to help you contain and control dust in your work area is absolutely money well spent. Not only does that dust management create a healthier environment for you to work in, it creates a happier one. You get things done faster, you are less frustrated, you don't have to stop constantly to vacuum and wipe down every surface of your work area. A dust extraction system is a really, really smart investment.
dangerous trends have been around as long as people have. Oftentimes they were associated with beauty standards of the day. Think foot binding and tapeworm dieting. <sighs> but the trend that I want to share about with you now is the most dangerous craft hack I have ever seen, and it is called fractal wood burning. Fractal wood burning or Lichtenberg wood burning is a technique that uses high voltage electrical current to burn patterns into wood. Oftentimes these patterns look like lightning bolts or trees, maybe tree roots. If you head over to Etsy, you will see dozens of charcuterie boards and candle holders and vases, all that have been decorated using this technique. I first heard about fractal wood burning this last summer. My younger sis introduced me to Anne Reardon's channel here on YouTube called How to Cook That. Anne is a food scientist and dietitian whose channel is amazingly crafted. It is part fabulous baking show, part debunking smackdowns of content farms, and they're very often faked hack results. In her video from June 17th of this year, Anne addresses this craft hack known as fractal wood burning that has killed at least 34 people in the US. I'm gonna say that again, this craft hack, craft hack has killed 34 people. This is my microwave oven. What's it doing out here in the workshop? Great question. Well, it turns out that microwaves are actually a key component to this very dangerous hack. Inside of this microwave is a high voltage transformer, which essentially takes the 110 volts coming in via this extension cord and transforms it into the 2,200 volts it takes to heat up my coffee or pop my popcorn. Inside the guts of this microwave, those 2000 plus volts are safely contained. But if I were to remove the transformer, in order to access and reapply that voltage to some new and totally different application, well, I would be quite literally releasing the beast. No longer am I protected by the safety measures built into this machine. Instead, now it is completely up to me to protect myself from enough voltage to stop my heart 10 times over. In these homemade machines, people are taking these transformers, plugging them into their home power outlets, and then attaching car jumper cables. The alligator clips are gripping some kind of metal spikes, which they then touch to the surface of a pre-moistened piece of wood. When the machine is turned on, those 2000 plus volts begin to burn the patterns into the wood. So in order to make these cool designs in this piece of wood, I am quite literally inches away from lethal levels of electricity. If I make the tiniest error, if I touch some part of the metal on the clip or these spikes, this dampened piece of wood and possibly even the tabletop if it is not on a non-conductive surface and that lethal amount of voltage travels into me. And as my electrical engineering dad seen here explaining a solar light to my niece explained to me, the particular setup of this hack makes it an ideal situation to cause a deadly shock. That's because if some part of my hand comes in contact with that electric flow, it is perfectly set up to travel up my arm, across my chest, and down the other arm, completing the circuit, which is just exactly what it wants to do. And if that weren't terrifying enough, this lethal level of voltage will not stop unless someone else is there and runs to turn off the power. That's because the safety mechanism which exists in my house and in most modern houses, which is designed to trip the circuit breaker, cutting off the power if it senses someone is being electrocuted, will not be able to detect that happening in this hack setup. 
Our high voltage transformer doesn't use wiring to connect that transformation through. It instead uses a magnetic field. The net result is that the safety sensors in your modern home will not shut off the power if someone is being electrocuted with this hack setup. It's as if there is a wall between it and what's actually going on. It cannot sense it. It's almost as if it's blind to what's happening. In one extremely tragic case in Wisconsin, a couple was electrocuted by fractal wood burning equipment. And because the power was never shut off, their entire house burned down as well. We do know that the fire started in the garage before spreading to the home. We believe that the fractal wood burning equipment that caused the electrocutions likely started the fire. Here's a clip from Ann Reardon's video over on how to cook that. Now that you know just how many volts of electricity are going through that and that there is no safety off switch, I want you to watch a couple of these clips again and tell me, would you walk this close to a fractal wood burning machine knowing if you just brush that wood with your leg, there's a seven out of 10 chance that you're dead. I am so glad that Anne's video has had the exposure that it has had. However, that was after YouTube pulled it and her audience had to push for it to be reinstated, all while all of these dangerous how-to hack videos have remained up. Here in the DIY maker, painter, flipper, woodworker corner of the YouTube averse, I really want to help spread the word about the dangers of fractal wood burning. Understandably, folks in our little community might be more likely to be interested in trying out this incredibly dangerous hack. For that reason, I am coming to you, my audience, with an extra special ask. If you found the information in this fable to be rational and sound and important, then please, please share this video. Share it to your Facebook groups, your DIY groups, your painting groups, and certainly with any individual you think might be interested in trying out fractal wood burning. Together, let's get this word out about this all too dangerous hack. I want to give a huge thanks to Anne Reardon for her permission to reference her video and use a clip from it. If you haven't checked out how to cook that, I highly recommend that you do. Anne Reardon is fantastic. She is creating quality content while she takes on the clickbait farms and even YouTube itself sometimes. <laughs> Well, that is it for this very special fable. Thank you so much for staying to the end. I hope that you are all happy, safe, and sound. Thank you so much for joining me, my friends. I will see you next time for more Furniture Fables. Painterly, Biff here. Say, I, uh, I wanted to thank you ever so much for fixing me up the other day. Uh, I thought I might make you a cheese board using all my saws and decorating it with some gasoline and my blowtorch. Hmm. Oh, well, all right, Painterly. Painterly says, go to Pottery Barn instead and buy a thank you cheese board. Hmm. Hmm. Painterly, Biff here. Oh, you're in surgery. Well, this'll just take a minute. I've been to Pottery Barn and picked you out a truly excellent cheese board. Yeah, they've got nice stuff there, Painterly. Yeah, it's shaped like the state of Oregon. Well, anyway, Painterly, I'm still feeling a manly urge to decorate your cheese board with some wood scorching and... Huh? Oh, well, all right, Painterly. Painterly says she's sending over a safer way for me to express my wood scorching needs. Ooh, hey, I was fast. Will you look at that? A true art pyrography pen. Huh. I think I'm gonna burn some decorative crap into this cheese board after all. Thank you, Painterly.